Hi, Louis. Uh, welcome to our day virtual uh, 2021. Oh, good. It's good to see you, Chip. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Louis Sahoyos, the uh, Oscar uh, award-winning director of The Cove and the director and producer of Racing Extinction, as well as uh, many other laudable accomplishments uh, to uh, our Our Day <clears throat> virtual for Earth Day uh, 2021. And um, Louie, uh, how's, uh, how's it going for you in this first quarter of 2021? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a, a very good Armageddon. <laughs> it's, uh, um, you know, this is, it's, we have a lot of projects going on, so it's really nice to have this time to sort of assemble so that when things do open up, uh, you know, we're ready to go. We have about nine projects in the works, nine films, and a big project with the United Nations, a big projection project. You mentioned Racing Extinction, and that's... Uh, you know, one thing we, we end that film by doing, you know, alerting the world, hopefully that, you know, we're going through what's called the Anthropocene, the sixth mass extinction on the planet. A lot of people weren't aware of that, but when we started flashing endangered species, you know, 60 stories tall on the Empire State Building, people took notice. And, you know, it's a, almost a, a billion media views within five days, you know, top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days worldwide. So we started getting some attention on the, on the subject and hopefully, you know, the world's shifting. You know, uh, I, I run a little organization, uh, it's, it's called OPS, uh, the Oceanic Preservation Society. It's kind of a misnomer now. We've had, you know, mission creep, I think in a really good way in that we realized that to save the oceans, we really need to fix what's going on on land because um, what we do on land obviously is affecting the oceans in a major way now we realize. And it's not just overfishing, but we're acidifying the oceans, we're heating it up. We're destroying the coral reefs, not, not just overfishing, but, you know, we're losing the coral reefs. I think we've lost half the coral reefs in just the last four years. And your coral reefs are homes to about 25% of the species on the in the oceans. So when you start losing ecosystems like that, you know, we need to be signaling that things need to, need to change and they need to, to change rapidly because we need the oceans to survive. I know the, we've, we've lost about, I think it's 40% of plankton since the 1950s and plankton's responsible, for, you know, Sylvia Earle says for two out of every three breasts that we take. So, you know, we keep on chipping away. It's, it's almost like we're breaking the legs off of David or the arms, you know, when you start, you know, you can sort of see there's still a statue there, but like when you start knocking off the pieces of the ecosystem, that you need to function, you know, it's, it's not too long before, and it is actually coming after humans now. I mean, we're, we're starting to feel it in a, in a major way. And that's, that's part of what we're doing is not just create the awareness. That's kind of almost the easy part. Now I want to say that it's, a, it's probably the hard, it's, it's still hard to, to create the awareness because people have compassion fatigue, right? They have so many issues, so many problems, personal problems that how can you worry about a whole ecosystem? But I mean, it might be getting ahead of ourselves, but what we want people to realize is that everybody holds a solution. You know, every, every person, you know, it, by making a, a, a slight, you know, people say, well, you know, what can I do? And I say, you know, if you want to change the world, change what's on your plate. You know, because what, the food that you put in your mouth has a direct effect on, on the oceans, on the atmosphere, and probably more importantly, what we're realizing is on, on your body. You know, that we used to think, OK, well, if people will change their behavior you know, if they realize that species are dying. It's like, no, not really. About seven, we do, you know, there's a white paper that was done and about seven percent of the population will change, for instance, their diet based on species, you know, uh, compassion for other animals or compassion for the environment. The other 93 percent just don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. Not enough to change what they do. But if you can change the narrative, you know, change uh, the way people think about food, that is actually an improvement for their health. You know, if you look at the blue zone, the so-called blue zones, Dan Butner, uh, National Geographic fellow. I used to work at National Geographic, you know, for about two, almost two decades. And, and Dan actually came in right after I left there, but he's a National Geographic fellow, a writer, and he wrote about the blue zones. The blue zones, there's five known blue zones in the world uh, where people live the longest without chronic disease. There are like when the, you know, the, the people that study demographics and huge populations were like, what's going on in these little villages? 
in Sardinia and Okinawa and the Nagoya Peninsula and Icaria, Greece and Loma Linda, California. What's, what the hell's going on over there? And that they're living 10 to 12 years longer than the rest of us. And they're not dying out of the same things that we're dying. They're, they're, you know, they're, they don't have the chronic diseases that we have. And they find that 95% of their calories come from a whole foods plant-based diet. It's a real simple solution. So, you know, instead of framing it like, hey, you know, give up food so that you can save animals or the environment, we're, you know, reframing it to, you know, change your diet and you can live longer. You can be with the people you love the longer. You can, you don't have to take the same bottles of pills that your parents were doing to reduce their, uh, their high blood pressure, their diabetes, and maybe, you know, you can even prevent cancers. We're working on a film right now on on reversing Alzheimer's. And it looks like, you know, with early stage and the tests that they're doing with early stage, uh, the first cohorts, the first cohort, cohorts, it looks like out of early stage Alzheimer's patients. I remember people have spent billions and billions of dollars over decades working on drugs to try to reverse Alzheimer's. And the, the best they can do now, uh, I think it was Eli came out with a drug that they announced about two weeks ago, it just slows down the progression of the disease. But with a you know, with lifestyle medicine, you know, changing your diet to more whole foods, they're finding that 68 to 67 percent of the population that they tested can actually reverse Alzheimer's, start to go the other direction, start to get progressively worse until you lose your mind completely. Uh, you can actually, it looks like, you know, the tests are preliminary. They've only done about 25 people through the cohorts. But, you know, it looks like you know, you can reverse, we know what you can reverse heart disease, diabetes, some forms of cancer like prostate cancer with diet and lifestyle, no drugs. So these solutions are, are upgrades. You know, they're not just like, hey, you know, be a, be a monk and save the planet. It's no, you know, eat healthy and be around and not have to worry about, you know, the last years of your last few decades of your life, you know, being a, in, in a, 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 either a steady decline or a very rapid decline. Right. Well, I'd like to um, talk to you about uh, an extraordinary project that uh, that you're organizing called Projecting Change 21. But before we get there, uh, and relative to what you just said about uh, our lifestyle and our diet, I, I want to just throw out there that we know that we're emitting about 40 uh, billion tons of CO2 each year as, as a human race, and that that's, we're packing that on top of approximately two, two and a half trillion that we've already put up there. And the IPCC says that we're gonna have to remove about half of that in order to stabilize. And that's not counting the uh, acid and the plastic that we've placed in the ocean that is also devastating uh, the biosphere and really you know, starting to mess around with the fundamental construct of how oxygen is produced. Um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, two out of three breaths we take, maybe even more than that, in fact, uh, come from the ocean, the phytoplankton. So my question to you is, when you made the movie uh, The Cove and you became a, a, an activist, and then you went on to make the movie called The Racing Extinction, and as part of that, you projected images of endangered species onto the United Nations, and onto the Empire State Building and actually onto the Vatican. Um, you began to raise the awareness. And, and I guess what I'm trying to get to is um, how do you see that information penetrating mass consciousness? How do you see the films that you make on diet, for instance, affecting how we produce food on the planet? And, and, and where do we, how, and how do we um, really wake us up as a society in the United States, but also in China and India and the rest of the world? Yeah, all, all very good questions. Well, first of all, you do it with the most powerful weapon that we have in the world, and that's film. You know, when we made The Cove, The Cove, for people that haven't seen it or don't know about it, it's about dolphin hunting in Japan. And... At the time that we were doing that film, they were killing about 23,000 dolphins and porpoises every year for human consumption. They were eating them. They were actually force feeding them to school children at schools because you have to eat everything on your plate. So you serve up a pilot whale, which is actually just a large dolphin, even though it's toxic, extremely toxic. All of the dolphin meat that's been tested in Japan for the last 
30 years has been found to have any, anywhere from five to 5,000 times more mercury than allowed by law if it was a fish. Of course, these are mammals, so it gets by in a loophole. So it was finding its way uh, onto the school children's plate and they had to eat everything on their plate. They had to eat this poison. Mercury is the most toxic non-radioactive element in the world. There's no reason it is your body doesn't need it to function. It's a poison, it's a toxin. And it gets bioaccumulates essentially uh, up the food chain from plankton up to swordfish and tuna and, and the large animals and, and to our own bodies. It's about six tropic levels of the food chain. And each time you go up one of those levels, it's an order of magnitude, so times 10. So you have like a million times more mercury in swordfish than you do in, the, let's say, the equivalent weight of plankton. So to answer your question, when we did that film, people were saying, oh, you're never going to change. You know, this is cult, this is culinary imperialism. You're never going to, you know, change the way that people eat in a foreign country. You know, you eat cows, pigs and chickens and they just happen to eat dolphins. And I said, well, you know, if our chickens had, you know, 5000 times more mercury than allowed by law, if it was a if it was a fish, I would want to know about that. The people in Japan didn't know about it because you go, you go to the Japanese Ministry of Health site, they, there's actually information there on, on how much a pregnant woman should eat. Even though it's toxic, it's going to hurt her baby. You know, I don't care how much good is in that dolphin meat. If you have mercury in it, it's going to affect the nervous system, the central nervous system of that precious baby. Once people started to get that information in Japan, the, the, the amount of dolphin deaths went down the first year it was like 60%, and now it's at about 93%. That 23,000 figure went down to, I think, six, uh, 610 the last time. I might have that wrong. There's six, 1,610 uh, animals, dolphins and porpoises were killed for the last year that we have data. And that's like a 93% drop because of the film and the activism around that. So films are very powerful weapons. And so we thought, well, if we can use a film to help solve this, this issue that's seems like a big problem, you know, in a small, in a small part of Japan, in a, small, in a relatively small country, can we use film to make a, a dent on the most important existential problem facing humanity? And that is the Anthropocene, this age of man, where, you know, there's been five major extinctions in the history of the planet. We're going through a sixth one right now. But, you know, at, instead of a meteor, you know, being the cause of the last disruption that killed the big dinosaurs, now this time, we're the mediator, the, the meteor, the, the, you know, humanity has become, you know, Vishnu, you know, the, the destroyer of worlds. And so, you know, I, I really feel like it, once people have the information and they have the solutions, they can make a, they can make a change. Listen, you know, the, I always bring this up, Chip, when I, you know, the first R-Day I went to, and I don't remember how many years ago that was, it's probably, I don't know, 15 now, I can't remember, but, um, the, the environmental movement was just getting started. People were saying, oh, it's, you know, solar and wind is less than 1%. Electric cars were a, are a fad. They're never going to, they're never going to scale. And now look at what's happened. I mean, everybody's, you're doing, there's this major switch to alternative energy. You, you, what, one of the things we did for recent, recent extinction, we took a, uh, a, a Tesla, you know, a Model S, and we turned it into a Bond car. First car in the world to have an electroluminescent paint job. We had a FLIR camera, forward-looking infrared, infrared camera that came out of the frunk. And so we could see carbon dioxide or methane in real time. Because these are invisible gases. You can't see them, right? With, we figured out a way with a special filter. You could actually see carbon dioxide and methane. And then we projected uh, those images out of the back of the car from on a robotic arm. We had a, like a IMAX style projector that came out so we can project on mountains or uh, buildings, skyscrapers a mile away. And then, uh, you know, we had a disappearing license plate, but we wanted to make it into a bond car. And we, so we talked to Elon Musk about this, this car that we wanted to do. And, you know, he didn't give us a deal on the car, but when we did the interview with him, it was in October, it must've been October of 2012. And uh, we, had, we were getting set up for an interview and he says, do you mind coming back in December? And I said, why, what's, what's up? He says, well, if I don't hit my, we're, we could go bankrupt. If I don't hit my numbers next quarter, then you know I, I could go bankrupt. And now, so I, I, I tell that story because now he's one of the richest people in the world. Tesla has motivated all the other car companies in the world to switch over to electric. So this, I, this, this Pollyanna idea that we have that you can change the world is true. You know, it is the crazy ones that do it. I had a, 
you know, after I saw An Inconvenient Truth, I, I bought an electric car. It was one of the first three that at least I knew about in Colorado. It was a fully electric 2002 Toyota RAV. You know, I went to your conference. I went to, to our day, you know, American Renewable Energy Day, and I saw it, and I, I drank the Kool-Aid. I had 120 solar panels on my roof, you know, driving around electric car, and I looked like a nut. You know, people, I, I was, like, so excited. And now the rest of the world's catching up. These, these revolutions that we have take about 10 years. You know, when you look at another person, I think it was Tony, uh, is it Tony Saba? Is that his last name? Tony Saba, yes. Yeah, the Futurist. I remember seeing him at our day. And it was a, an amazing talk where he, he, he showed what the inevitability of fossil fuels and electric cars taking over. And you look at that, and he showed, one of the slides he did is he showed a slide of the, the 1900 Easter Parade in New York, looking down from a, a building on Broadway, and it was all horses, except for one car. There's one car that was probably electric. But then 10 years later, or 13 years later, the 1913 uh, parade, it was completely reversed. It was all cars find the horse, one horse in, in, the, in the whole parade. And remember, people, you know, we have this sort of romanticized idea that, oh, that was, you know, a better era of, you know, when, when horses were the primary form of transportation. But I had a great grandmother that lived in New York. And she said, you know, you could smell New York you know, from, you know, it was from six miles away, you know, she, this is, a, so she was born in like 1880. And so she remembers like the Bronx was the Bronx farm. She could swim in the East river. It was so clean, but he said, she said the New York streets were full of manure. You'd be stepping in the manure. You'd be bringing, bringing to the homes, the school, the businesses, it stunk. There was flies everywhere. So the transformation happened very quickly when people saw the need for it. The same thing, we're at that, that nexus right now where people have to understand, hey, now we have to get rid of the cars with, with internal combustion engines. We have to trans, we have to motivate very quickly. Just one solution is to get onto electric cars. If you've never driven one, you know, every other car becomes a relic. If you, once, you've, once you've driven in an electric car, it's like, oh my God, this, there's so much torque, it's fun. And if you're powering it with alternative energy like we were doing, you know, you never go to a gas station unless it's to fill your tires with air. So <clears throat> I guess to answer your question, I, I, what we, we try to do is accelerate this change by doing these films and these projection events. And it's working. You know, I think a lot of people are, you know, tens of millions. Well, the, the first day that we were on Discovery Channel with Racing Extinction, 36 million people saw it in 220 wow. countries and territories. So, in the, you know, probably maybe 100 million saw it since then. But, but there's some really good data that shows that you'll need 10% of the population to be 100% committed to change to these sort of scientific revolutions that we have, you know, the awareness and here's the solution. They take about 10 years before you have the, the switch. And I think we're at the beginning of this hockey stick curve where instead of something negative happens, something positive is happening. And that's, you know, in uh, the projection event, you know, like I said, we, when we did the, the when we did the, uh, dangerous species on the Empire State Building. People said, "Oh, that's that's nutty. It'll be, you know, it'll, you'll never be able to pull it off." And what we did, it became this great sensation. We, it, the Fifth Avenue, right below the Empire State Building, when we lit it up with endangered species in 2014, it was like we stopped it like it was the Easter Parade, and we thought we didn't think we could get any more attention than that to the subject. And then the Pope called, and the Pope wanted us to. You know, remember, Pope Francis is named after St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of animals. And during at the last COP, before this was the COP 21 in Paris, um, he wanted world leaders to know that there's more at stake than just humanity. He wanted that the whole animal kingdom, the whole natural world is, is, is in peril. And then I think we had 4.4 billion media views on that, that projection event. And 600 media was there, about 225,000 people watching it live. And we started to get the conversation really going. And now the UN this time, they want us to do a projection event for three days. Not as, those were all single day events. Now three days so we can build it and project on the east side of the east of the Secretariat building. So it's like a 38-story right. building. Right, let's set that up. So, uh, Louis, uh, what you're referencing is what happened at the Vatican in 2015 while the Paris uh, Accord meetings were happening. Simultaneously, you were projecting images of endangered species on St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. You generated 4.4 billion uh, views, impressions, and now you've assembled a team 
with, uh, an, with a great, amazing group of people, including uh, Travis Treacle and uh, Chris um, uh, uh, and, and, all, and these other guys and, and, and ladies. And, and, um, and now you're looking at uh, putting images onto the, the United Nations for three days in October of this year for three hours a night. Go ahead and set that up. What are, what are we actually looking at? Yeah, well, it's a, a, we're working with the United Nations to try to, the Secretary General has a, 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 a mandate. They're calling it the, uh, the decade of change. We have a, about a decade to really turn this around before it's runaway climate change. And so we're going to use the building. We've been asked to use the building to, as a as a, a way to present the solutions for these existential threats, and so that, that's what we're working on. It's a it's a big event. It's a big lift of what we're trying to do. But listen, it's it's just it's not just the content that we generate. You know, because of you know the people that we know that have been working in this space for a long time and been working on different aspects of this, this these same issues we can hopefully go and help get their content, you know? So like Jeff Orlowski who did Chasing Coral, you know, he just has these time, wonderful time-lapse images of, how wonderful, horrible, you know, time-lapse images of, the, of, of losing the, the Great Barrier Reef because of a bleaching event. Um, you know, there's all these people that we know in the, in the, in the space and basically using the building, this 38 story building to amplify these messages. That's what we're doing. And, you know, when you th try to imagine now, if you're on the East River looking at the, at the Secretary building, it's the building that sits, you know, almost flush on the, on the river, proud on the East River with the entire skyline of New York in the background. So it's very surrealistic. And because it's the, the, the UN, I was uh, explaining it to a friend today. And I said, I said, remember that scene in Independence Day you know, this is you know, where the, they're trying to rally all these people that would normally would war together, but, you know, people coming together because it's the UN, we're going to have, this going to be a global voice. There's going to be indigenous voices. The global South is going to be represented. We're going to be speaking in the, you know, all the languages of the UN with translation. And so it's going to feel like the whole world is using this building as the siren, as a, uh, a warning and a, a, a beacon of hope of how we navigate to the future. So to me, it's not just like, here's the solutions for climate change and, and, and so solutions for poverty, which is all in a wrap because it's the, the, the poorest people are gonna be the most affected by climate change, are being the, both the most affected by climate change. So it's gonna feel very global in scope, you know, musicians from around the world, artists from around the world, speakers from around the world coming together on this building. And so what we've discovered, what we did these projections of events that everybody shows up with one of these and each one of these becomes like a, another beacon, another uh, broadcast system. You know, each, each person, you know, you might have, you know, hopefully hundreds of thousands if not millions, even if COVID is still a problem because on the opposite side of the river from Manhattan is Gantry State Park, where you can, even with social distancing, if it's still a problem at the end of October, you'll be able to get you know, millions of people there over the course of three days to take a look at it. And they're all going to be using their phones. The media is going to be there. And the hope is to, I would say the hope, the mission is to have a billion people, not just look at it, but a billion people take action. And that's the key. How do you turn this event? So we'll have QR codes. You want to hear Jane Goodall or Greta Thunberg speaking at 38 Stories. You see, you see that they're talking. You want to hear it. You have a QR code. Latch onto it. And now we have a way to communicate back back with you. And then we can do this over social media. The media is going to be there. We're working, you know, working on uh, having media partners. So we want to blow it out big. We want this to be a big, huge event. You know, and the UN is saying this might be the biggest messaging of campaign that they've ever done. So this is, it's exciting. And yeah. It's and you're, uh, you, you've timed it out such that it's happening one week before the start of uh, COP26 in, uh, in Scotland. And um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, how those two things fit together in terms of uh, projected outcomes. Yeah, well, I mean, world leaders are gonna be move, uh, obviously getting together in Glasgow 
and we've been actually talking with the, the Glasgow City Council. They want us to bring the projection event there as well. So right. it's very exciting. Um, yeah. So the, the week before COP, I mean, all the all the decisions of what they what the leaders are expected to do will have happened before COP. But what we want to do, I mean, you've done this before, Chip. You, you, you know, we go to Congress. You you talk to you know, Senator Whitehouse or any of the people that are friendly and that you say, this is a huge problem. And they go, I understand, but I don't have a constituency. I want with those billion people that are, you know, hopefully becoming active, I want to cre help create a constituency, not just for America, but for the rest of the, the world. And by the way, the rest of the world really gets it. In America, we look at it as being divided. Well, the rest of the entire world, the other, you know, 192 member states, you know, nations of you know, the UN, they think we're nuts. You know, we were, you know, we're a little bit different than the rest of the, the countries. We have this feeling like we're split or it's a, it's a debate. The rest of the world is not a debate. You know, what we're, what we're talking about now is we want to have a constituency so the world leaders and American leaders feel like they, they know what's at stake and they, they have the tools that they need to create the change that we need. It's all about the speed and scale. I've heard you say this, you know, ever since I've been coming to our day, it's about speed and scale. And this is, this is the one way, and that's those, those words stuck in my head. I, kind of, I keep on thinking, okay, we need to move faster. You know, we don't, we don't have time to debate this anymore. We have to be t taking action right now. And I think this new generation coming up, they get it. They get it because of the work of a lot of activists, you know, like, you know, Greta and, you know, Jane Goodall, and you, you name it, you know, Attenborough's now on the, you know, on the bandwagon, you know, it used to be kind of taboo for him to mention, you know, the, the conservation angle, but they're, you know, they've been on the fence too long. And we have now, we're, we're speaking as a, as a, I want to say a unified front, but it's feeling like a chorus. And now what we want to do is just get people together. And, you know, we're not going to have all the answers over those three days, but we want to use, you know, this global platform. What, what, we've, what we've discovered about the, the projection event is that there's a certain power of the building that happens. So we projected on buildings all over the world, but it's the, the ones that really count that, you, that have like an intrinsic um, metaphorical value. When you project an endangered species on the Empire State Building, it's like the, the, it's the symbol of capitalism. And what you're doing is saying, this golden lion tamarin, this, this monkey has as much value or even outsized value that we've been overlooking it. And you see it and it becomes surreal. It becomes a moment that like everybody becomes a photographer or a cinematographer when they're putting their camera up and it's designed that way so that you, you, there's a, a power in the, uh, of the building and of the image that big. And the same thing happened in the Vatican. Whether you're Christian or not, you, it, it's, if, if we could have done that on, you know, let's say the, the Taj Mahal and it would have had the same effect but it's like spirituality. It's about love. It's about uh, people coming together for higher goals. You know, you could call it godliness or you could just call it just, we're all part of creation. And when you have, you know, the, when we went to the Vatican and uh, uh, we were summoned there by the Pope, but we were meeting with his number two and they were sitting there sort of kind of st uh, stone faced looking at us like we're going to project on the, on the Vatican. This is, a, this is our idea. Our idea. And this, we're there at, at an invitation of the Pope, you know, explaining what we want to do to his number two. And this after like a half, half hour presentation, they were quiet. And the, the number two goes to us and says, and I'm not going to try to mimic his voice, but, you know, he's speaking in Italian. He says, the, you know, the, la the last artist to, to do anything on the Vatican was Michelangelo. <laughs> I hope you make us proud. And, you know, we, and I, I think when you, when you take a building and those images and you put them up on a building like that, now it, it says something else in, in the UN, the secretary of building, probably more than any other building in the world represents the world coming together to hopefully try to save world World, you know, to solve world issues. So that's what we're trying to do is to take the power of that building and the power of some of the best photographers and cinematographers in the world and create a moment over three days where people feel like we're, we're, we're going to come together and solve the biggest threat humanity has ever faced. Fantastic. Well, that brings us pretty close to the end. And just in concluding remark, in the next couple of minutes, Louis, uh, 
in terms of the activist conversions that we're hoping for, and I know that we're working with folks to try to really pinpoint what those things are that we're asking the viewers to do in their communities and their cities and their countries, et cetera. Um, how do you see this going forward? And uh, if this is a decade of change, uh, 2022, 2023, 2024. How, how do I see it? Well, number one, it's not gonna just be us. You know, we're working in concert with a lot of organizations. Uh, the, the UN itself has a lot of entities within it, you know, ind indigenous populations, you know, where people working on gender genders, people working on the forest, people working on the oceans. So it's going to be a, a whole suite of solutions. It's not going to be one. But the, but the message that I always say, if, if, you know, when people say, well, what can I, I do? I say, you want to change the world, change what's on your plate. The average person in America eats about 10,000 animals in their lifetime. It's hurting your health. About 85% of the chronic diseases we have can be reversed just by cutting, you know, animals out of our diet. That's number one. You, have, you save about 400,000 gallons of fresh water. You know, animal production is the biggest cause of freshwater pollution. It's about responsible for about 14 and a half percent of greenhouse gases. Um, about 9,000 square feet of land every year has to be, you know, used for animals that we're in turn going to eat. So an extremely inefficient way to get energy from the, you know, the sun, from plants, put them through an animal and then eat the animal. I mean, if you're going to go to Mars, you're not going to grow it with a farm. You're not going to put animals up there. You're going to be eating plants. And it's because it's a more efficient way to do it. So, I mean, that that's the simplest thing. But, you know, what 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 I did was when, you know, when I first went to our day, you know, I bought an electric car, installed solar panels. You can you do whatever you can do. You know, you can work on a individual level. You can work on a community level and you can be part of this chorus where we're telling world leaders this is important. This is the, the most important issue of the day. And in, in fact, I, I could argue that if we don't solve this issue, everything else, you know, the economy, I, you know, I, I don't want to go through people and say, oh, that's the most important thing in the world, but they're all going to be a footnote in history if we lose the planet. You know, this, this is the, <laughs> the, the, the earth is the structure that holds all the problems, that holds all the solutions. But if we screw that up, everything else, it doesn't matter. So, you know, we, we have to be taking care of the ecosystem, number one. Right. Okay, well, I just want to um, uh, thank you for your dedication, your leadership, uh, your vision, and, um, and say that with the recent political change that we experienced in America, I think that that can continue out uh, to influence the rest of the world and so what we accomplish at COP26 will also play forward to COP27 and 28. And that I hope that, um, that projecting change, you know, I want to thank you for inviting me to join the team as a, um, a special advisor. And that I hope that we can take this successfully to the United Nations, but then also take it next year, perhaps to the Great Wall of China or to the Taj Mahal in India and to really be, continue the momentum that's gathering right now where all of the citizens of the world change their diet, reduce carbon there, but also begin to transform their lifestyles in terms of the vehicles they drive and the energy that goes into their um, uh, homes uh, as we transition from fossil fuel uh, through renewable energy to I think what will happen is it'll become a, uh, a green hydrogen energy source that will help us to, to solve these problems. So anyway, thanks again. And um, anything else that you'd like to say before we conclude? <laughs> that's, that's, that's about it for now, I think. But thanks, Chip. Thanks for the opportunity. It's good, good talk to you as always. Yeah. Okay, Louie. Great. Look forward. All right. Cheers. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.